Good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN, and I'm honored to welcome you to a conversation tonight between co-authors Dr. David Brindell and Ryan Steltzer and economist Marianne Bertrand. Thanks for attending. FAN is a nonprofit organization that presents a high-quality speaker series offered free to the public on a wide variety of topics, including human development, mental health, education, and social justice. We have over 150 videos of past events archived on our YouTube channel and website, so please be sure to explore. And now, David Brendel is a co-founder with Ryan Stelzer of Strategy of Mind, an executive coaching, consulting, and leadership development firm rooted in philosophy and psychology. They are also authors, co-authors of Think, Talk, Create, Building Workplaces Fit for Humans. Dr. Brendel is an expert in applying cognitive psychology and leadership techniques in executive coaching and corporate training programs. He earned an MD from Harvard Medical School and a PhD in philosophy from the University of Chicago. Ryan Steltzer has written articles for the Washington Post, Huffington Post, and LinkedIn Pulse, among others. He delivered a TEDx talk in April of 2017 about the journey that led him from pursuing a graduate degree in philosophy to a position at the White House, to co-founding a global consulting practice. He holds an MBA from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. And then Marianne Bertrand is the Chris P. Dial, I'm gonna mispronounce that, Dialanist, oh boy, I butchered that. We'll just call her the Distinguished Service Professor of Economics at Chicago Booth. She will correct me when she gets a moment here. She is an applied microeconomist whose research covers the fields of labor economics, corporate finance, political economy, and development economics. Professor Bertrand is a co-director of Chicago Booth's Rostandi Center for Social Sector Innovation and the Pritzker Director of the Inclusive Economy Lab at the University of Chicago Urban Labs. And now let's welcome David Brindel, Ryan Steltzer, and Marianne Bertrand. Thank you so much for the introduction, Lonnie. So I guess I'm going to take the lead. And uh, first, thank you so much for you know, inviting me to do this. And thanks to Ryan and David for, um, you know, giving me the chance to read the book and have this conversation over the next uh, 55 minutes or so. And, and I would say that as, you know, someone that, you know, lives in a workplace and is trying constantly to try to make this workplace better for everybody, the book was just a lot of fun and, you know, very, very much uh, thought provoking. So um, I'm just going to have some questions. I'm assuming the audience has not read the book. You know, that's the idea. So I, I'll start with a question to both of you, really, which is like, what got you to write this book? Why, you know, kind of why this topic? Uh, what got you motivated to write about this? I'm happy to, to start. Uh, I, I think uh, both of us, and we've been working together now for about six years and exchanging stories from our different backgrounds. I, I come from medicine, psychiatry, and executive coaching, and uh, Brian comes out of the management consultant world uh, and uh, has worked in the White House, uh, as Lonnie mentioned. So we come from very different professional backgrounds, but I think what we've um, seen in common across the multiple workplaces and institutions where we've either been employed or consulted is that there is really a dangerous lack of uh, open and collaborative conversation going on. And we see it getting worse. We turn on the evening news, we see it every night and it's just been deteriorating, but it's it's been going on for a long time. And in the book, we trace some of the, the roots of this. Uh, when I say dangerous, I, I, I really mean it. We, there are um, life-threatening aspects of conversations not going well. So I'm, I'm from, medicine, I'm from the, a medical background. Physicians are really careful in their research and their scientific work. Um, in the business world, people do not play fast and loose with, with the numbers. Uh, things are done extremely carefully and Science uh, and mathematics have uh, improved our quality of life and uh, for a long time and we see the continuous technological revolution going on because we do science and math very carefully. What we don't do carefully is conversation. Um, so people with the greatest scientific and business minds go into conversations, not planned, not intentional, not careful. There's uh, most of the conversations we have, <clears throat> um, I'm guilty of it. I think we, we all are in different ways. They are not strategic. 
Um, we spend more time uh, expressing our, our views or opinions. And as experts in different areas, that, that is part of what our job is, is to bring our knowledge and expertise. But we lose out on a lot of important data by not calmly asking the right questions. Uh, and there is more scientific study going on now about failures of conversations. Well, one study kind of shocked me. It said that 98% of conversations, and they did this somewhat rigorously, 98% uh, of the conversations, the, the conversation ends with one or both parties feeling unsatisfied and like it ended at the wrong time. It ended too soon or it went on for too long. Uh, on the other hand, there are studies, um, including in infants, that show that <clears throat> good conversations where you're not talking at somebody, but talking with them uh, lead to enhanced development of uh, the Broca's area of the brain, <clears throat> which is the area that's uh, responsible for expressive language. Um, there's scientific uh, interest in that. So what we, I think bottom line in our book is we are saying conversation should be disciplined. It should be approached just as carefully as uh, your spreadsheet, your PNL, or um, you know, what you're doing in a research lab or, or with a patient. Uh, and the percentage of time that we go into conversations in the workplace with that mindset is low. Uh, and in, in the book, <clears throat> and I'm sure we'll be happy to get into some of the details, but we do talk about uh, catastrophic uh, uh, outcomes from that, um, sometimes for patients, sometimes for uh, companies. <clears throat> uh, sometimes for airplanes falling out of the sky and hundreds of people dying uh, as a result in part of, uh, of a failure of, of conversation. So, so, so we, and we've developed a methodology, which I'm not going to get into right now. I want to turn it over to Ryan. Bit, um, but, and, but we, uh, we, we don't want to just critique the problem. We, uh, we present a uh, yeah. evidence-based solution. So before, before we go to like the evidence-based solution, maybe it's worthwhile. I mean, certainly all that you said makes sense. And again, thinking about my own workplace, which was really kind of what I was thinking about as I was reading the book, uh, you know, kind of why, why do you think we are failing at, you know, kind of this more kind of open conversation, which clearly, you know, could be good for, you know, you know, for the organization, right? So why are we failing? I mean, certainly like if I think about my own life, you know, I fail at that because I feel like I'm rushed all the time. And, you know, kind of being rushed is not consistent with open-ended conversation about, you know, kind of things going on, which I think you call kind of like, you know, kind of this open kind of active inquiry, um, right? That's the term that, that you throw out the book. So why, besides the first thing that comes to mind, just, you know, always being rushed, why do you think, you know, a lot of organizations, workplaces are failing at, you know, this communication thing? It, it seems to come from a really positive place, if I may. So in management consulting, our job is to solve problems for organizations. And when individuals sometimes forget this ability to engage in active inquiry with one another, as we call it, think, talk, create, when they forget to engage in active inquiry with, with one another, it's, a, it's in a desire to achieve a solution or reach an end goal. They, people, we want to solve each other's problems. That's a great thing. That's a, that's a noble goal and noble aim. So I think that I, I assume people come at um, workplace conversations with positive intent, and it's just a desire to reach the solution as fast as possible, as efficiently as possible. And sometimes in reaching that solution, solution as quickly as possible, we forget the best way to actually reach the most innovative or the most creative or most profitable solution. Um, and what's interesting too, is you mentioned when you were reading the book, um, thinking about your own workplace. And one of the unique challenges that we had with the book, it was it actually, it was, a, it was a blessing and a curse was that there were so many stories. Everyone that we spoke with had a story about a negative workplace environment that we should include. So when we came down to decide, okay, we have 10 chapters, what stories are we gonna tell? There was no shortage of stories that we could tell. It was actually difficult for us to sort through those, those stories. And so we knew that we were onto something because everyone we spoke with said, Oh, have I got a story for you? And they, mm -hmm. had this, they had this experience. We all know workplaces that we've been a part of that are negative, that are toxic, call it what you will. And we can also probably think of some workplaces that we've been a part of that are positive and that are creative and innovative. And we were trying to write a book that would capture a way to, to yeah. make your bets to build those innovative environments. Yeah. And I mean, I think the other thing that came to mind as I'm thinking a lot about, you know, 
diversity and inclusion. And everyone right now is trying to really implement diversity and inclusion. And we feel like the diversity part is kind of quote unquote easy. I don't want to, you know, kind of make it sound too easy, but the inclusion part, like how do we do the inclusion part? Seems like the hard one, right? How do we implement that within an organization? I think your book made me think about it's a broader problem that we're facing, not just how we include, you know, kind of the voices of people that may be, you know, kind of, a, you know, either a gender or racial minority within the organization, but like just really but be much more globally inclusive of all the views and, you know, kind of um, senses of people um, that, you know, have something to say. Which, which gets me to like, you know, as I said, the book is not simply about diagnosing kind of that something is going, is going amiss but really about trying to offer, you know, a method to, you know, try to move towards uh, better communication and hence the title of the book, kind of think, talk, create, and really like three distinctive steps that you are suggesting. So maybe we can start is like with quote unquote, the theory of what these steps are. And then I'd, I'd love to hear more about examples because you guys, you know, apply this, coach organizations about to do this, but let's do that next. Let's just first kind of explain, you know, kind of the theory about how we can make change happen and improve, you know, kind of open inquiry and, you know, and conversation. Yeah. So I don't know who wants to take that on. What is Think um, Talk for me. <laughs> I'm happy to, to, to jump in about this part. And I would <clears throat> uh, use what you said, Marianne, about um, the rushed nature of the workplace as a way to, uh, to launch into the methodology. Because uh, the think step is really about slowing down from the rush. What is rushing? Rush is, a lot of our rushing is, is based on fear. Being stressed, overwhelmed, worried that we're not going to get things done, worried that we're not gonna hit the numbers, that we're not going to get all the uh, all the notes written or in the medical record. Now, we can look in, all, in every different part of the professional world where there, there's fear. Uh, if you don't hit your numbers, you might lose your job and be homeless. You know, it can lead to pretty pretty catastrophic thinking. That's very common. Uh, and so, when the stress hormones are surging, when there's fight or flight involved. Uh, uh, the amygdala is firing deep in the uh, in the brain. This has been shown in, in neuroscience research. Thinking breaks down. So the, the, the initial step is think. None of what we talk about in the book can get off the ground without um, some degree of self-reflection and slowing down. So we really encourage people to think for themselves. What is it that you can build into your workday that can slow things down? Uh, like you must schedule some breaks or taking, it doesn't matter how many emails you haven't answered, you've got to take a 15 minute walk. Uh, many people are using mindfulness meditation these days. We don't want to prescribe one particular way of doing it because it's very personal. But if, if you can't slow down and put some of the piles of work aside and engage in some um, calm self-reflection where your heart rate is a little slower and the uh, stress hormones aren't surging as much, doesn't get off the ground. So that, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the theory of the uh, think stuff. And again, it's based in cognitive psychology and neuroscience. Uh, if, if you are not able to do that, then you can never get to the talk stage, right? And the, the talk stage is where what you were referring to about ac active inquiry is the method of very carefully, again, in a self-disciplined, even scientific way, constructing open-ended questions. So what's an open-ended question? And you know, we have a very focused definition of that. It is a question that uh, cannot lead to a yes or no answer. So if your boss says to you, you're gonna have this to me at four o'clock today? Well, that's not an open-ended question. That's like either yes or no. <clears throat> it doesn't open up conversation. So a question that starts out with more like, How's the afternoon going? When do you think we can sit down and take a look at, uh, at the report you've been working on? You know, when do you think you can have it to me? Now, in some cases, a, a boss may have to come down and say, I need it by four, but that's, that's unusual and that's farther down the road. It's better to get the conversation going. And so it has to be carefully thought out and a sculpted question. And again, this is where the planning and the care and the self-discipline comes in. You don't just barge into someone's office and say, you need it by four. Start out with 
conversationally calmly, how, how's it going? It's, it's, it it um, breeds respect in the workplace, which people do well with, uh, a sense of empathy, but it's not just a feel good method. And we want to be clear about this. This is not just about soft skills. We see the open-ended questions as data gathering, right? So you don't want to be barking orders at somebody if you don't actually know what's going on with them. Um, if you just ask the question, you may actually get some really good news. <laughs> oh, I've already got it done. Uh, uh, it, it, but if you're barking it too quickly, you're, you're not getting important information. And so if you do need to be uh, very directive later in what you say, at least if you have the information, you know what to be directive about. So again, part of it is soft skills, but part of it is also framed as data gathering. So as much as you would run a gel in a lab or uh, do a research study or due diligence uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a company or a private equity firm, the open-ended questions serve the same kind of uh, sci scientific role. Once the active inquiry gets going, uh, you move on to the create step, which is of course the ultimate uh, goal here. And we have a wide view of what we mean by create. It might mean, well, you create a, a wonderful new product or a wonderful new service, maybe a financial service, some other kind of professional service. In some cases, it's, uh, and we talk about different examples in the book, it may be the outcome of a, uh, of a difficult negotiation that gets created. Uh, and even more broadly, it may be uh, the creation of a workplace culture where people feel psychologically safe and, and can thrive. And psychological safety, which is this idea uh, uh, really well researched and bowsed in recent times by Amy Edmondson at Harvard Business School, uh, psychological safety underlies all of this. Uh, an active inquiry, the slow down, ask the open-ended questions, get the right kind of conversation going. That's what promotes psychological safety. And we can go into more detail. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll turn that over to you, Ryan, about some more of the Project Aristotle stuff, uh, which shows uh, where Google demonstrated that psychological safety is the best predictor of high team uh, performance in companies. So think, talk, create. Active inquiry is a, is a huge part of the, uh, the book uh, and really what can be uh, most trained in some way. Some of the training programs we run uh, get people into conversations where they are forced. Yeah. You may not make a statement. You can't give yeah. advice. You can't uh, bring your expertise. You just have to ask another open question. Very hard for experts, especially experts who are in a rush. Yeah, that makes all sense. Before we talk about Project Historial, which was interesting, and you know, I definitely want to hear about it. I think one of the questions I had, and I think it's a, it was a kind of a question throughout, you know, my reading of the book is what is what is the outcome that we're trying to achieve out of this, right? So think, talk, create for what? And there's a version of it that sounds very like management consultancy e variant without you know trying to like you know be aggressive here which is that yeah you know there's lots of things that we could do that would make us performing better performing financially performing better as an organization if only we were to listen to people that actually know things and whose voices we never hear because we never take the time to slow down and ask them open-endedly you know kind of what's up and what's going on there's lots of kind of examples of that throughout the book right that's one view. So basically think, talk, create as a path to like a better performing organization with a very narrow definition of performance, which is, um, you know, better ideas, which is a better product, which leads to like better earnings at the end of the year. But I think there was another undercurrent as I was reading the book, which is think, talk, create for a more humane organization. It's more than an undercurrent of the book. I think the book is all about the humans, the humans inside of the organization and acknowledging the humans and very often, you know, kind of acknowledging the humans doesn't go hand in hand with better financial performance, right? So, you know, so, so I guess I have a question for both of you, which is what, what is the end goal of Think Talk Create? Is it kind of a standard kind of management consultancy? to see if we do this, we'll get better ideas and hence, you know, more financial returns for our investors? Or is it that we become a more humane organization, which may not go hand in hand with better financial return? I don't think, 
you know. Okay, so whoever wants to take that. <laughs> I, I love that a U Chicago professor picked up on the subversive themes of our book. That was one. I'm no <laughs> surprise there that someone from U Chicago caught that. Um, you're precisely right. If you were to say, if you were, if, if it were a question that were framed from a non U Chicago professor and they were to say, what's the aim of Think Talk Create? My answer would be that it's, it's, it's twofold. On the one hand, absolutely. There's a quantitative argument. We can get into a psychological safety later, but there's a quantitative argument for why this model is important, why it should be implemented and why it should be used and how it can help your organization financial. It can help your bottom line. So Think Talk Create can help your organization grow, innovate new ideas, uh, retain staff. I mean, you want to look at the, all of these different performance metrics. It can help in that, in that capacity. No question. That's the surface. And then the second layer of Think Talk Create and what it can be used for is exactly as you point out, a more positive work, work environment, a more humane work environment one in which we're not seeing employees trying to get to the top of the roof and jump. I mean, unfortunately, that's an unfortunate reality in today's working world. You have Kuroshi in Japan. I mean, this is a, this is a real phenomenon where employees are, are, are choosing to end their life over their job. And that wasn't the motivation of the book. It wasn't that we were writing it exclusively for those tragic cases, because the reality is that most cases of people working in toxic environments thankfully don't end in that way. However, we are trying to build more positive workplaces. And the key element though, I would say that last piece of the puzzle, this, this, the sort of, the, of that second lane of Think Talk Create and its application is that this is not a CEO only approach. So we're not suggesting that CEO should read the book and therefore they should adopt the model and then the organization would follow. That's great. We hope that CEOs do read the book. But we also hope that people who are working in the middle cubicle read the book as well, because they have agency in Think Talk Create. They have the ability and the responsibility to create humane environments as well. It's not just a top-down approach, and it's, an, it's a bottom-up approach as well. Yeah, I, I would add that, uh, Marianne, I, I think you did really hit on a core dilemma here of the book as to, you know, whether are, are we trying to uh, put a process out there to optimize financial outcomes, you know, in the short term on a quarterly or annual earnings report. And we think this process, we have some evidence for it, is that does work much of the time. Google showed it and there are other research studies that do show it. But there are some challenging cases here. Let's, let's think about Amazon for a moment. Amazon is the highest valued company in the United States right now, and it keeps growing. Uh, and their workplace has been far from humane in, in many cases. So that, that's, that is a real um, tension that we've, that we've tried to, uh, to, to grapple with. Uh, of, 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 in, <laughs> in a lot of Amazon fulfillment centers, there's not a lot of Think Talk Create going on, but they're unbelievably profitable. So I, your question is, is, a, is a really important one. And, the process we're trying to lay out here doesn't answer the question of what our values are, but what, what it tries to do is put a process in place for us to discuss the values. Because we, we, we don't, we're not looking to make a pronouncement that capitalism run amok is okay. And, and the opposite argument that uh, companies shouldn't be paying attention to uh, their bottom line and shareholder value. Not, uh, we're, we're trying to put a process in place where there's a civil discussion of the values. Uh, and uh, you know, we would hope Amazon is discussing it openly. And my, uh, you know, and again, as Ryan said, whether it's in the executive suite or across the organization, we would hope they would look at our book and say, are we having the right kind of discussions about what we're doing here uh, in terms of balancing profitability and uh, any humane work environment? Right. That makes, that makes sense. And, and again, I think it, it kind of remains this kind of open question, but I think the book does have the examples. So let's go to that, you know, the Google example, this project Aristotle, and this, this for people that on the, on the podcast, it's not podcast, on the webinar, if you want to just refresh on all of your philosophers and Greek philosophers, there's a lot of that in the book. You know, Project Aristotle kind of was, you know, kind of one example that, you know, was in the book, even though it was kind of misnamed, if I remember. Uh, but let's go through that. So I think what this demonstrated was evidence that, you know, kind of 
think something like think talk create could be consistent with better performance. So Brian, do you want to, you know, do you want to explain what, what this was? I was very Absolutely. curious. Right? And, yes. and full disclosure, we were not a part of Project Aristotle. So we were not participants of the study. We did not conduct the study and we had no, no affiliation. So yeah, the simple story is this. A few years ago, Google wanted to know what made the high performing teams perform well and what made the low performing team perform poorly. It was, it was Google being Google. They wanted to figure that out. So the original hypothesis was that teams performed well as a result of casting. Casting being if I put an introvert with an extrovert or a senior manager with a junior employee, what have you. If I, if I pair people together and I piece together the right teams, that's going to be an indicator of performance. And in the words of Google, they were dead wrong. That was not an indicator of performance. The only measurable thing that they found that was an indicator of high performing teams. And we can, the, the question of what is high performing is actually, it's interesting as well, but let's just for the, let's accept that we sort of agree and understand what high performing means. Um, the, the only indicator of high performing teams was this idea of psychological safety. Now, psychological safety is more or less in simple terms, the ability to share your idea freely without being judged or reprimanded or ridiculed. So it's, it's a culture in which you feel like when you're in the meeting with your boss, you can raise your hand and object. That's really kind of a simple way to think about it. If you feel comfortable at work tomorrow, going into the, the morning meeting, the, the daily meeting you have, and, and offering an, a, a, a parallel idea to one that's being presented, then chances are you're on the track of, or you're, you do live in, and work in a psychological safe environment. So Google conducted the study and that was what they found that psychological safety was the indicator of performance. And it was just that environment, that team environment where they could share ideas freely, where team members did not feel discouraged to share creative solutions. And you can, if you start, if you actually think about it, well, geez, it makes sense that those were the highest performing teams because they were the ones brainstorming all the time. They were always working, you know, two heads are better than one. It's, it's almost like psychological safety is a fancy term for two heads are better than one. It's like you're working together collaboratively in a proactive way to build whatever solution you need to build, whether you're in IT, whether you're in sales, market, what have you, psychological safety was the only indicator of performance. So that was what Project Aristotle was, and it's been really important. And we should, uh, David mentioned, um, we should, Amy Edmondson has been the champion of psychological safety as of late, and she's at Harvard Business School. Um, and she's, uh, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a fascinating concept and a really important one. And I, I would argue the most important business concept, at least in the early 21st century, perhaps the entirety of the century, who knows, we'll see. But it's a very important important concept for workplaces. And um, the, I think it's the last chapter of our book we call Project Socrates uh, to supplement um, the, the, the values of uh, Project Aristotle, as Ryan said, are about open brainstorming without fear of being judged or criticized or having any reprisals against you for a bad idea. Uh, but the way to get to the psychologically safe environment of Project Aristotle is through dialogue in the active inquiry methodology. So here's a put, Socrates and Aristotle um, didn't always see eye to eye, but there's the great Raphael painting where they're walking together. And Socrates looking up to the sky to the highest values and Aristotle has his hand out saying, oh, let's stay close to the ground in science, but they're in a dialogue together. So that's one of the additions that we wanted to bring in the book. And again, some of it's based on our consulting practice. Some of it's based on research that the way to get to psychological safety is through active inquiry. So let's, let's move to that. So because I'm, I'm totally bought in on the value of like open, you know, kind of open communication, I'm, you know, open communication and there's a lot to learn from others and this is how we're going to get creative because we can, you know, listen to each other. And all the question is like, how, I'm, again, I'm thinking about my colleagues and I have like, you know, it's going to be an uphill battle to teach them to engage in this active, you know, active inquiry and be open to all of the ideas out there. So, which gets me worried that it's really just, you know, something that you're born with, but, you know, you guys have a consulting business, a coaching business surrounding this. So, assuming that we found an organization where, you know, this is not working, you know, people are really not openly talking to one another. How, how do you come in and what can you do to try to fix that? And I'm going to call it that. I'm going to call it the culture. We haven't used the word culture, but I think it's also about, you know, the culture of the organization that's missing. How do you, how do you fix it? So tell me in practice, 
how do you implement all this? Well, oh, go ahead, David. Uh, no, I, I was going to suggest um, maybe maybe some of the vignettes we have to just give a thumbnail sketch of how yep. to do it, right? Because Marianne, so, some of it is based on presenting the types of people, your colleagues that we're, you're describing with research. But to really get people to buy in on this, it has to get to the gut. You have to see it in practice with somebody you know or really with mm -hmm. yourself. And so that's a lot of what we try to bring out in the uh, in the uh, in the book is specific situations where uh, individuals or, organ or organizations went on quite a long journey from not uh, being able to in in engage productively in open conversation to really getting there. Uh, I really like the real estate. I really like the the real estate company. The example that is it real estate yes, company. Yes, that was yeah. really good. A portfolio of good questions. Yep. Yeah. And right, so, what, what, yeah, what, yeah, so the story yeah. there was we were leading a seminar for a, a property management firm and it was somewhat a, it was a siloed group. So you had the lawyers sitting with the lawyers, the accountants sitting with the accountants and what have you. And the way in which we actually start to introduce this culture change is we live that culture change. So the minute we're in the door, we begin practicing active inquiry as part of the program. So it's sort of being from you, Chicago, it's a bit subversive in our approach, but we begin our, our and we, we, we implement our seminars by practicing what we preach. And so what happened was, is this real estate firm, uh, it was an annual meeting and we were facilitating this exchange. And one of the questions that we pose, an open-ended question was, um, what keeps you up at night? And as the tables began to share their stories, the lawyers had very predictable answers. The lawyers had legal things that kept them up at night. The accountants had, a, had accounting issues and the IT staff had a, IT issues. And this property management firm invited the maintenance staff to their annual meeting because they were important members of the team who take care of the buildings. And one of the custodians raised their hand, sort of a burly gentleman, um, and said that loss was what kept him up at night. And the room sort of got quiet and we... we continued active inquiry and we asked them to expand upon that. And it turns out that these custodians, when they were working in, in the buildings, they would be doing obviously their, their required tasks, but they developed these close relationships with elderly residents in the building. So there was one story in which this gentleman developed a very close relationship with this woman, an elderly resident, and she would always ask him to open her jar of pickles. She had all these odd tasks around the house that she couldn't do on her own because she was lonely. She lived alone. She was, you know, in her in her late 90s, I think. And then inevitably, she was no longer there to ask him to open the jar of pickles. And so these custodians who had these deeply personal relationships with their customers, in a way, uh, were experiencing grief and loss. And so the company ended up actually implementing a grief counseling program for the team members. So it was a, it was a really positive step that they took as a result of active inquiry. And that's just one small example, but um, we, it, the, the, it was a really moving story when the, when the custodian sort of shared that, that, that deeply moving experience. It, it changed the whole feeling in the room because we, it was like a three hour session and it started out like, everyone's looking at their phones and they're on their computers and they're getting up and taking calls. And it was, it was hard to engage them at first. Uh, and they're talking about too many emails and people not you know, underperforming and the other team never uh, responding to what they need. And uh, you know, after we got to the point that Ryan described when they're listening to the custodians, they're like, well, there's like one group in the room that's actually talking about what matters which is a, a connecting with the customers. Uh, and it wasn't just the, the elderly residents, but it was their family members who had, you know, were positively affected by knowing that they had uh, had their loved one go into an assisted living facility where there was some human, human connection. So they told us months later that it made the workplace better and that the company was doing very well. And it's very hard to, draw a straight line from our active inquiry session with them for a few hours to a better uh, profit and loss statement six months later. Would you have a well, sense, okay, David, of but, like... But oh, go ahead, they, sorry, go they, ahead. Their own report was that things were a lot better. Would you have a sense of what stuck? I think that's the thing I was curious when I was reading the example. Like, you know, obviously, like, yeah, you know, kind of 
you make us realize the big picture of what we're doing here and there are people involved and you know and i can also see the channels by which this could make things better for the organization because now we kind of think about our customers we understand our customers better and all of that but do you have a sense of like how that moment you know what kind of changes that moment like led to within the organization that you know kind of would have left would have led to like kind of longer term this sticking and impacting the organization I think what we actually saw when we were there, which is, you know, our most direct uh, knowledge of it was that they started, the table started talking to each other. Um, and instead of the, you know, the legal group being angry with the accountants or the social workers for not filling out the forms and the reports that the regulators need, needed, they were actually talking about it. You know, what's going on with you guys? Uh, oh, Somebody left, there was a maternity leave. That's why you're behind. Let's actually have a conversation about what do we need this week and what can maybe wait a month. So, and, and uh, so it was the breaking down of the silos um, mm -hmm. through more conversation with more of an emotional human connectedness about it that seemed to just relax things in the workplace and, and lead oh. to higher performance. So th that's what I recall seeing, Ryan. Was there any other aspect of it? It's also important to note that it's an exercise. So think, talk, create an active inquiry is an exercise. So it would be like saying, let's go run a marathon and going out tomorrow and trying to get as many miles you know, on the road as we possibly can. But chances are we're not going to accomplish that marathon in one day for training for it. We're gonna have to build up sort of our, our our endurance and our skills. And just like any skill, active inquiry is something that can be cultivated and needs to be practiced. And so if we're working with organizations, yes, a workshop's great, but it's also encouraging and maybe yeah. enhances the opportunity for success if we're sort of there to help ensure that the training wheels can come off the bike down the road. Our goal is to not establish some sort of dependent relationship where we want them to always, uh, you know, be, be engaging with us. But ultimately, it's not a one and done uh, exercise. So here, we're going to expose you to it. You're going to see it. You're going to see how it's how it's impactful and how it can work. Um, but now we're going to have to practice that moving forward, just like any other skill that you need to develop. What's cool about active inquiry? What's really special about active inquiry is that it's not we're not learning a foreign language. We're not, it's, it's something that's already sort of innately within, it, within us. And Think Talk Create is, is, is profoundly human. And so we have the ability within us. It's not like you're a good singer or you're a bad singer even. It's, we all have this capability. Can we develop it, cultivate it, nurture it, and then bring it to work with us um, uh, to, tomorrow or next week or next month as we, as we continue to grow? Yeah, and what you said there, I mean, could have also kind of reminds me of another way I was kind of reading the book, which is like when I think about what's wrong with, you know, kind of thinking about the whole ESG, CSR kind of side of things and, you know, what's wrong with like capitalism right now. And there are many things, but one of them is very much kind of the focus on short term versus long term. And right? focus on short term makes you to make very different decisions when you are more longer term oriented. I think, you know, strategically, you know, open inquiry and, you know, trying to understand, you know, kind of what all of your employees, even like a broader set of stakeholders kind of think. Might become might, be, might become a very valuable investment. So that was really kind of the other way I was reading the book is like you know open inquiry and slowing down is part of like you know kind of like think a bit kind of longer term rather than you know what's going to happen uh, over over the next quarter. Um, there's there's a lot there's a lot of um, behavioral science in the book and there's a lot of philosophy in the book. So I know behavioral science better than I know philosophy, even though I pretend to teach ethics to MBA students. Um, so can you tell me more, maybe maybe kind of like, kind of the, the relationship with behavioral science and, you know, kind of think people talk about behavioral economics, like to talk about behavioral science, because it's much more than economics, it's mainly psychology. So, you know, uh, I think one person's name that you know, appears many times in the book is Danny Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize in economics not so long ago. And, and I think some parallel that you're drawing between Danny's thinking about system one and system two and the idea of, you know, of, um, um, of, of thinking, you know, and, 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 and slowing down. So do you want to, do you want to just, just explain this to, you know, the, the audience? Sure. I'm, 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 I'm happy to, to take that a bit. Uh, 
there, there is there is uh, there is quite a bit of uh, of neuroscience, but hopefully it's put in a in a way that's pretty pretty readable. Uh, so I, I would say a couple of things about it. Uh, one is we we make we sort of describe the distinction between the irrational part of the brain, which is the older part of the brain, the amygdala, which fires away very rapidly. That's the part of your brain that gets you to um, pull your hand away from a burning stove. Mm -hmm. You don't wanna be thinking about that. You just gotta get um, your hand off the stove and um, critical for survival, but not very helpful at times when you go into the workplace and you need to have a strategic conversation with somebody. And so this is the distinction between Kahneman's system one and system two. And part of the gift, and in some ways also the curse of evolution is the, is the frontal lobe, which is the rational and executive brain where we can plan and strategize for, for, for the better or for the worse. Uh, it, it can be used uh, for better or for worse. Now, much of, uh, and you know this better, much better than me, Marianne, but I, I think very high level overview of economics through the 20th century was a major focus on rational self-interest. That's the microeconomics that was taught in the, in the classroom through the 20th century and even beyond, which focuses on thinking uh, a, 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 about rational self-interest, supply and demand, how do I optimize uh, mm -hmm. profit and minim minimize loss. And uh, the, uh, the contributions of Kahneman and Richard Thaler and other many at the University of Chicago uh, uh, economists is behavioral economics, which puts the focus back on the emotional drivers of, of, of decision-making and particularly spending. Uh, and so part of what we try to get at in the book here is that active inquiry serves as the bridge between the, the emotional brain, system one thinking, and the rational brain, system two. Uh, but what behavioral economics uh, re really shows us is that if you don't connect with your customer on an emotional level, um, you're, you're not going to be able to get them to buy. Or if you're w working with employees, you're not going to be able to get them to perform. So we, we see behavioral economics as a, as a huge Nobel Prize, multiple Nobel Prize winners including at Chicago, uh, in, in behavioral economics in the last few years. But part of what we see in the, in the workplace, and this is whether it's business or medicine or other areas, is it's not really been applied <laughs> that much. Uh, it's, the theory is great, but we're, we're looking through Think Talk Create to bring the findings of behavioral economics into the workplace by um, laying out a methodology that leads to more human connectedness. But let's, can, can we just unpack a little bit because I think there I'm still I'm still often confused. So so like so when I think about system one, system two, yeah. there's the one that's just slowing down and thinking straight about decisions. So I'm somebody that studies discrimination, for example, right? And biases and implicit biases. And you know, kind of there's the you know the, the part of the brain that is just more thoughtful, slows down, is the one that we'd like to activate to make sure that we don't engage in implicit bias. On the other hand, it's also the more kind of rational part of the brain, right? The the other one that is you know kind of the the rushed one is also the one where emotions and things like empathy. Empathy is an important word, I think, in your book as well, right? Starts showing up more. So is, is being more thoughtful always consistent with being more, you know, altruistic or thinking about others or gentle or, or nice or considerate? I, I, I was struggling with that. And I, th I think this is a little bit in line with my first question about, you know, is this about a method to just do better financially or a, met a method to have nicer, more ethical, you know, organizations. Because I'm not so sure that the slow brain, you know, and maybe my view of human beings is, you know, again, I've been spending too much of my life with economists is that I'm not so convinced that people care uh, so much, except maybe because they think it makes them look good, but at the core, maybe they don't care so much. So just remind me, do you want me to be more system one or system two? I was not, I was not totally sure. 
I guess the answer would be yes. Uh, <laughs> Either, both, well, a bit of both. No, I'm, I, no well, I'm, gr I'm glad, Marianne, that you brought us back to this question because it really is at the core question of the book. And we don't want to answer the question too. It, it's, such, it's, such a, it's such a tension. We, ought to, we have to learn to live in, in the tension, but I do want to say something more about it than, than just that. Uh, it needs there need to be there need to be integrative functions. One, one of my favorite examples from the book that where we try to lay this out, uh, and we want to have it both ways. Okay, we 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 do want economic vitality. We believe in the capitalist system. Um, so this is not a, this is not some socialist system where everything needs to be redistributed and everybody's treated. Um, we hope everyone's treated fairly, but it's not, it's not, a, it, it's not a socialist re redistribution. It's, it's capitalist economics. And we do want that to thrive and be vital. And we also want people and companies to do the, to do the right thing. So um, one, one of the chapters, this is near and dear to my heart because it's my favorite professional sports team. Uh, we, we show this through the uh, journey of the New York Islanders hockey team uh, that, uh, Started in the 1970s, blue collar Long Island, deep connection to the community, but a very hard scrabble and underfunded team. They were losing money. They had a, some great years in the 1980s of winning four Stanley Cups in a row and then very much on hard times. And so they did a rational analysis. They did a system two analysis, which said, our arena is falling apart. Um, we're losing money. We're the laughing stock of the league, and there's this fancy new arena in downtown Brooklyn. Let's move there. This corporate luxury box is it's right near Manhattan. It's going to be a lot, a lot better. Great, great arena. So they move down there, uh, and it all falls. It go, it gets worse because now they've lost their fan base. Nobody in Brooklyn or anywhere in New York City has any emotional connection to this team. So there's a they have a choice between a crumbling arena near their passionate blue collar fans. Uh, or a swanky corporate arena where nobody cares about the team. So we kind of saw that as a, as a setup. It, should it be a rational analysis? Well, the rational analysis led them to Brooklyn and to losing money. Um, the emotional analysis keeps them on Long Island and losing money in a crumbling arena. Uh, so what we saw there uh, through a think, talk, create process, really among team owners, fans, county executive, governor uh, and other stakeholders was how do we get this team close to their fan base, but in an arena that's going to, that's not crumbling. Uh, and the arena is opening next month. Uh, it's, uh, it, it was a big public private partnership to move the team to where the fans can get, you can drive there now, you can park, you don't have to get on the train and go all the way into Brooklyn. Uh, and it's going to be the nicest arena in the country. So how did that happen? That's the kind of outcome I think across the business world we're looking for, where there is an emotional connection. The, the, the fans or the customers that have the emotional connection have the opportunity to spend it, but it's more rationally designed. The old arena didn't make sense anymore. So I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to that arena. I'm planning to go to a lot of the games there. Um, even though I live in Boston. But that's the kind of solution we're looking for. And it was a good solution, not just for the profitability of the team. Mm -hmm. It's good for the community because the, 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 the community was kind of hollowed out when that it's the, it was the only professional sports team and a huge part of the community identity. And it was kind of like when the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Dodgers moved to California, it ripped the heart out of the community. So that's being replaced but in a more rational way. So those are the kind of outcomes I think that we're, that we're looking for. And that may be an unconventional way to, to lay it out, but that is a real, a real business that I think is, is going to do much better. And there, there was also a part of the book, Dr. Bertrand, that was uh, deeply influenced by you, which is why we were so grateful that you were able to join us this evening. And perhaps is a good example of that system one, system two dichotomy is in your convocation speech, which we highlight and feature in the book towards the end of, uh, towards in the, in the concluding chapters, you, you leave us with a really important uh, message into the graduates that day, which was the ability to vote with your feet. If you're working for organizations that are less than stellar in their, in their uh, the treatment of other human beings. And 
that decision to vote with your feet might be a good example of the application of system one and system two thinking where we really need to apply both. Um, it was a really, it was a, your convocation address was very, was uh, deeply impactful for us watching it, even though we had graduated many years ago. And so we just wanted to, um, to recognize uh, your, your speech. And we, that's why we included it in the book, because it was, it, it, there really was an important message there. And, and it, it is a good example of the application of both system one and system two thinking when you're voting with your feet. Yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for, for noting that. I, I should note as a, as a funny anecdote, I was reading the book and got that part, the part of the book where you talk about, you know, vote with your feet from the commencement speech. And then right after that, you talk about Boeing. And that comes immediately after. And the, the fun part is that my husband works at Boeing. So I just mentioned oh. that to him today. Oh. <laughs> so I think this is one for, you know, for the storybooks. We'll keep on talking about it. I know that, you know, they're going to come with Q&A from the audience in, in, in a couple of minutes. But just one question. You obviously wrote this book during COVID. COVID was a massive change to what workplaces look like and will be most likely for a lot of people a permanent change to what workplaces look like. Do you briefly think about, you know, kind of this kind of environment to the extent that most people are going to be in the workplace in this kind of environment interacting as being, you know, positive for active inquiry or, you know, something that goes step us back even further when it comes to active inquiry? Yeah, absolutely. I can tell you a really quick anecdote. I know that uh, they'll be coming back with questions in a moment. There's a client of ours that we were working with, and they obviously went remote, as we all did. And this is a, an, uh, an accounting firm. And when they finally got their team back together, they realized they looked at their numbers and they had grown exponentially throughout COVID, which is not a story that you typically heard in professional services, that companies were growing at such a high rate. And when we got back together, we led a seminar for them and they were living Think Talk Create throughout COVID, throughout the pandemic. If the pandemic has left us with any realization, which it's left us with several, but work is profoundly human. We're now out of the office. We're now working remotely. Yes, we're interacting with one another via Zoom, but we're interacting with human beings via Zoom. And work, what, what remains, the work that's left when we're not manufacturing widgets is human interaction. And the company that we worked with that, that implemented Think Talk Create throughout the pandemic and live Think Talk Create grew exponentially throughout COVID. And so we, if, if it's sad to say, but we, we COVID, yeah, it has disrupted our work lives, professional lives moving forward. So Think Talk Create is perhaps even more applicable now than it was three or four years ago. Yeah, yeah. I, I would add. I mean, we all know the tragedy and loss of life that uh, that COVID has brought, and fully respect the, the the tragic nature of that for so many millions of people. Um, at the same time, it may be the biggest gift to the um, world of work. Uh, it's sa so sad that it had to come this way. But uh, as with the company Ryan just mentioned, we're seeing much more conversation going on about what the workplace should look like. Should it be in the office, at home, a hybrid? That can't be imposed anymore. Workers are voting with their feet. You know, we, we know lots of people have left companies where they say you have to be in the office. Well, I don't need to be in the office. I can go work over there. Uh, so there's there's a huge, I think it's called the great resignation, uh, which is going on now. So there, there's a huge realignment, reshuffling of what the workplace is going to uh, to look like. And uh, and, and we hope the, the methodology that we, that we outline here uh, is a contribution to how the discussions go. Yep, that sounds great. That was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. I know I'm going to pass it on to Lonnie with questions, but thanks, David and Ryan, for uh, allowing me to do this. Thanks for writing the book, too. Thank you, Dr. Bertrand. Uh, and you. Professor Bertrand, thank you so much for a very thoughtful and challenging. I like that you kind of uh, took it to both of our co-authors here and challenged them on some of their premises. I appreciate that very much. And thank you both, everyone, for a great conversation. A reminder that you can come to After Hours. It's going to start at 8.05. We're going to give Ryan and David uh, a five minute bio break in between this and after hours. Uh, you can get access to after hours and continue this conversation, buy a copy of the new book, support the bookseller, support these authors. So we have a great question from Sarah from Q&A and she says, 
I have, and we're at 756, we have about four minutes left. I have to imagine that techniques such as hot seating or hotel style office formats adversely affect the ability to establish the think talk create structure in the workplace. Any ideas for how to engage in active inquiry, et cetera, when the physical space of the office doesn't lend to psychological safety? It's a great question. It's a, it's a terrific question. And I'll pass it. No, I'll pass it to David. I was going to do the, the point. No, that's a terrific question. It's a challenging question. And so the the at the end of the day, active inquiry and think talk create relies on human conversation and dialogue. And there's no question it's it's more beneficial to be seated with one another. And when you're engaging in dialogue and having that, there's a lot of think about when you're trying to read a text message from somebody and you can't really understand if they're joking or they serious or you can't really understand tone in, in, in when you're reading. Similarly, on the phone, it can be more difficult. But of course, in person, there's body language or reading one another. And so ultimately, the quick answer, it's a short answer. But the quick answer is that as long as you're engaging in conversation th through any medium, if you can still practice active inquiry by, by engaging in those open-ended questions, then you're going to be a step ahead of the curve. And there's a longer, there's a, a, a longer explanation there, but I think as long, regardless of your medium, practice active inquiry. David, did you want to hop on with that? I think the only thing I would add there is see if you can get a conversation going about getting some better seating in the workplace. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Like, I mean, who, who can you ask? You know, I, I, if you're the boss, ask the people that are reporting to you what would be the best environment that would be conducive to these conversations? Naturally, listen to the answer. Uh, if it, it means going to your boss, it might be a little bit harder, but you, you, you might ask, you know, you know, how can we think about reconstructing the space so that everybody can really feel more comfortable uh, expressing their views? So, I mean, I think our, our answer is always gonna be in some ways, do some more active inquiry. Uh, take what the problem is and see if you can strategically find a way to ask an open-ended question and promote a conversation. And maybe maybe you end up with a, a, a better work environment. All right, and so I'm gonna end up with one last question here, which is um, curious as to what is for the corporations or uh, potential clients who are resistant to your model, can you characterize the nature of their resistance? What don't they like about it? That's an interesting question. Thank you. From a, it's a Chicago question. Of course, yes, that's a great question. I, I, I mean, I, I think I would uh, probably approach it the way I did with the um, uncomfortable furniture, which is we try to ask them, yeah. what, what is it about the model that um, is unappealing? Uh, and, and again, that that is a question that takes the temperature down. Yeah. You don't want to be in a conflict, right? Again, you can't think if you're revved up. So we just ask, so what, what's unappealing about this? Make it collaborative. Uh, and for us, we, we want that data. Maybe there is something unappealing about it. Maybe, oh, it doesn't, maybe it doesn't work in this environment, or maybe we need to make some adaptation um, for that company. So yeah, I think the, the answer, uh, and maybe it sounds too knee jerk, is I think is always ask. I was thinking that it might have to do with um, people uncomfortable with inverting power structures. Oh. So, uh, lots of times if people like, you know, top down and they like a hierarchical model that the act of inquiry is a little bit more of a horizontal model and not everyone is particularly comfortable with that kind of model psychologically um, or as a philosophy. So yeah. um, anyway, moving on, we are now at eight o'clock. So gentlemen, thank you so much. You get a nice five minute bio break. We'll look for you in after hours. Mm -hmm. Again, Professor Bertrand, it was a pleasure getting to know you. Thank you so much for your service to FAN. And everyone who's been watching, thank you so much. We hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.